All right, so don't worry about plates. If you, if you need to get up and walk around and throw out your, your food, go ahead. I'm just going to walk through. I might give you, I, I title tonight uh, one of two titles, either um, A Feast of Freedom. That's how I tend to think of Sunday. So A Feast of Freedom. Or um, this comes right out of the catechism. It's a great line. It's a day of protest against the servitude of work and the worship of money. We talked a little bit about idolatry last week, and um, it ties into this one as well again. Um, I might encourage you to write down a couple questions, not so much to discuss the table, more to reflect on on your own in the course of the week. These are questions that I just find helpful to trigger thoughts about what it is the Lord might be um, trying to, to teach us. So is Sunday for you the Lord's Day? Or is it yours? Is Sunday the Lord's Day? Or is it Ken's Day? Do you see Sunday as the last day of the weekend or the first day of the week? Related to that, What's the difference between your Saturday and your Sunday? Practically. At least for me, like, especially when I was in my teens and my 20s, there, there was no difference. They, the one bled into the other, quite literally, some nights. There was no difference whatsoever. Five days I had to work. Two days were mine. I got to do whatever I wanted. Then Monday was the drudgery day, and you had to go back to reality. How seriously do I take the Sunday quote unquote obligation? How seriously do I take the Sunday obligation? How much time do I take in my life to thank God and to worship Him and to adore Him? Everybody's made to worship. Everybody here worships. That's a better way to say it. There isn't a person in here who doesn't worship something or someone. Some people worship college basketball. Some people worship money. Some people worship their children. We all worship something. How much time do we spend worshiping God? Do you allow yourself to rest Father Dave and I just had a great conversation about that this morning. He is um, a man after my own heart. I love uh, Father Dave greatly. He um, works intensely. He's, it's not good for him to live with me. <laughs> and I just told him that. Like, I'm going to be a lousy mentor for you. Like, I'm, not, I'm still wrestling to learn how to rest. And I see in you what I was 22 years ago. And you and I are going to be in the hospital next to each other after having had the heart attack. So I need you to rest for me, and you need me to rest for you. How much time do you take to rest? Most of us can't do it without guilt, especially men. Because if I'm not doing something, I'm not being productive. And if I'm not being productive, I have no value. That's why suffering is so painful for us. I'm not doing anything, therefore... I got no value. Related to that, but it's different. How much leisure is in your life and mine? And what is it? Like watching football is not leisurely, at least not for most of us. It's an event. It's anything but restful. Things fly, not just the ball. What do, what do, so what's leisure? Leisure is what you do when everything you have to do is over. That's leisure. Which is a problem because for a lot of us, it's like I never get to that point. 
because I don't allow myself to rest. And lastly, just think about what, what concrete things can you and I do to make Sunday more what it's supposed to be? I'm big on, I'm big on like having plans in life. I'm big on habits. Covey didn't make a lot of money for nothing, right? Seven habits of effective people. I mean, you live a great life by getting into habits, and you you live a not so great life by having bad habits. And so we have to learn to acquire habits, and. One of the, you know, it'd be great to leave here tonight and go, you know what, tomorrow we're just going to be saints, but that's not going to happen. So it usually starts by zeroing in on one thing. Like, what's the, what's the one thing I need to do in my life most that's keeping me back? And so, so for Sunday, too, like, what's the one thing that I can concretely do to help me really get more out of this day than what I get out of the day now? Okay. So the catechism, this is uh, starting in 2168, so just as a reference point. You can keep it open if you want. It'd be fine. But I want to tell a story before we dive into this, um, just because it, it's something that was really helpful for me, and it, uh, it changed a lot. So it changed a lot of how I understood life, quite honestly. Life, rest, heaven, and Sunday, which all have a lot to do with each other, I think. So about 10 years ago... Um, I took a three-week vacation in the summer, which was um, simply glorious. And um, went away up north with some friends. Uh, So for three weeks, um, we just, um, we did a lot. We we played like crazy. So I'm up early every morning, you know, like before the sun rises, just so I can pray. So we're up early, we're praying, saying Mass. We played 36 holes every day. Um, I'd come home and cook because I like to cook, um, read books, have great conversation, whatever, and then go to bed and wake up and do it again. So so one day, it was like towards the end of the vacation, I'm sitting on the porch where we were, and the sun was setting. And I remember just kind of looking at it, and I was um, incredibly rested. So... You know, my back didn't have the knot in it that it normally has, and I just felt great. And I, as I was looking at the sunset, and I um, was waiting for the other folks just to come outside and sit, that a line came to mind that uh, has always troubled me, quite frankly. And the line is uh, comes from how we often pray for those who've died. So we often pray for our faithful departed, may they rest in peace. I've always hated that line. Um, personally, because it just doesn't do much for me. Like, like I don't, I don't want to spend all of eternity resting in peace. Uh, I'm, I'm more active than that. So I hear rest in peace, and I picture, you know, someone on a couch with their hands behind their head, um, asleep, and that just doesn't sound like a great time for all eternity. You know, I don't want to be on a cloud playing a harp. But as I was sitting there at the porch looking at all this, I just felt like the Lord was saying to me, this is what it means, John. This is a glimpse of it. Because um, heaven isn't doing nothing. Heaven is very active. Heaven is the fulfillment of all our desires, uh, to use the language of a, a man I know who wrote a book with that title. That's what heaven is. It's the fulfillment of all desire. And so on this particular vacation, I was anything but inactive. In in fact, in a certain sense, I was exhausted. But I wasn't doing anything because I had to do it. So there was no compulsion, right? There was no had-tos. It was just, I want to, and it was life-giving as all get out as a result of it. And it's helped me understand um, how we pray for those who die and what it is that heaven will be like. It also helps me understand Sunday. So oftentimes when we, uh, when we think of Sunday, especially, so it's almost like prayer. So prayer is difficult for young people and maybe for us who are older too because somehow we have in our mind that silence means um, empty, mind. just empty your mind. 
We got E.T. trying to communicate with us or something. I don't know. Someone needs to phone home, so whoever you are, phone home. So, um, so prayer is difficult because people mistakenly think silence means do nothing. But silence means um, be still so that you can actually engage in a conversation because the, re- the requirement for having a conversation is somebody has to stop talking, right, and you enter into a dialogue. And so in a similar way, the, the commandment to keep holy the Sabbath, sometimes people mistakenly can understand is do nothing. You're not allowed to do anything on Sunday. Well, that doesn't sound like much of a gift. But that's not at all what it's about. It's, it's more a command of thou shalt rest. Thou shalt enjoy the day. That's why I love the way the commandment describes Sunday. Sunday is a day of protest against the servitude of work. So here's how a friend of mine once said it, and this is really uh, alarming, I think, but he, he would just ask the question, what kind of a culture doesn't want to rest? Well, that would be us. Most of us don't rest, or a lot of us don't rest. We just find it difficult to do. In fact, a lot, I find a lot of people as Catholics, it's almost like I need to ask permission to enjoy life because surely God wants my life to be miserable and painful and hard, and then the reward for that will be heaven. And some of us laugh, but, but like... It's amazing how often that comes up in conversation with people. Like, I'm really enjoying what I'm doing, and because I I am, I'm kind of guessing that this is probably not the right place, right? Because God wouldn't want that. He wouldn't? Of course he would. There's going to be enough pain in life. You don't have to go seek it out, right? It ain't for nothing that the first miracle that Jesus performs is what? Yeah, water into wine. How much wine? Let me show you. (laughs) Let me show you how much wine he made. These are 30-gallon buckets. That's what these are. He filled six of these. All right? Six of these with water turned into wine. This is a lot of wine, people. All right? This is a lot of wine, and it was great wine. And there's lots of biblical imagery behind that. Um, it was an understanding. Sorry, I'm taking your trash. I can't turn it into wine, so we're just going to leave it there. Um, so uh, there's, again, lots and lots of biblical imagery and symbolism that has to do with the fact that wine, no wine meant a, a time of great disaster and kind of a the time of wine was a foreshadowing of the fact that the Messiah had come. But despite all that, the first miracle is a lot of wine. It's almost like Jesus is giving us permission to love life. And I don't know about you, but as simple as that sounds, for, for me at least, in my life, that was very hard to really embrace for a long time. I felt if I was doing it, 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 I must be doing something wrong. I must be guilty somehow. And maybe you can relate to that. Maybe you can't. But it was, a, it was a reality. I used to tell my mom all the time, I want to die exhausted. And man, like some of you perhaps, I am really close. <laughs> and now I'm trying to ask the Lord to help me to get some rest too. So Sunday's a day of rest. Is it for you? Or is it just another day of the week? So I, I start there just because, for me anyway, this, it makes the, the commandment not more real. It, it makes it uh, come alive and, and bear some fruit. This is, that, that experience that I had on vacation is, um, is a taste of what it is that the Lord wants us to touch every week. That's why it's a gift. He wants you and me to be refreshed that day. 
by being with him, by being with each other, by doing things we love, and by pushing to the side things we are compelled to do. We'll talk about like laundry in a minute, moms, sorry. Or nurses or doctors or priests. Sunday is not a day of rest for me. <laughs> but I still find a way to let the Lord give me life through it. So in talking about the third commandment, it not only helps us to understand um, how we observe the Sabbath, uh, I think it also helps us to understand what it is that God has made us for and what it is that he's done for us. So he, he's made you and me one day to share in his own life. You will not be compelled to do anything in heaven, but you will do a lot. I ask my dad and brother that all the time. What are you doing right now? You're doing something. I know that. What are you doing? And no one in heaven's going, oh, gosh, I wish I could be back there. <laughs> that looks like fun. Shoot. Remember we used to, th this is not like a bunch of people reliving the good old days in high school. <laughs> right? That's not what you're doing. No one in heaven is longing for earth. No one. No one's going, oh, man, I wish I had grandkids. That would have really completed me. I wish I would gotten to see the Lions win the Super Bowl. <laughs> like, no, one's, no one's doing that. No one in heaven is looking at us with longing. They just long for us to join them. Okay? So uh, I want to look at um, three biblical observations about the Lord's Day. And then I want to look at a couple things in the catechism, and that will kind of be it tonight. So first two come from the Old Testament, and the third comes from the New. So um, Old Testament. So remember, there's two places where we find the Ten Commandments. Anybody remember where they are? Exodus and Deuteronomy, right. Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5. So there are, um, in the listing of the Ten Commandments, they're the same commandments. It's kind of good news, right? Um, but they're, especially with the third commandment, the motive behind its observance is greatly different from one to the other. We want to look at those two. So start in, uh, in Exodus. So Exodus chapter 20, uh, verses 8 to 11. So the pithy way that I would summarize the com commandment is God saying to me, thou must rest. And I'm going, no, I don't want to. I got too much I need to do. So Exodus 20. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. For six days you shall do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath for the Lord your God. You shall do no work on that day. Neither you nor your son nor your daughter, nor your servants, men or women, nor your animals. Note that. Everything is supposed to rest. This isn't like don't let the dog out and run. This is, this is an agrarian culture, right? So let the ox rest. <laughs> let the donkey rest. Nor the stranger who lives with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that these hold. But on the seventh day he rested. That is why the Lord your God has blessed the Sabbath and made it sacred. So the motive in Exodus has to do with creation. And it stresses uh, both the respect as well as um, the gratitude that you and I are supposed to have towards the one who made creation. So Pope Benedict, uh, who was the Holy Father before Francis, he said it this way. He says, this means that the things of creation are at God's disposal and that we can and must ask him for them. In other words, it's a gift, right? On the other hand, it means that we must not forget God's right of ownership when we use the things of this world. So, you know, for a lot of us, it's at Thanksgiving time, and it's almost kind of tragically limited to Thanksgiving time that we set aside time to thank the Lord for all that we have. But every Sunday, one of the motives huh, is to thank the Lord for the gift of everything because everything you and I have is a gift, starting with my life. Okay? Deuteronomy has a different motive. So Deuteronomy 5, verses 12 to 15. Keep going, three books. 
It says this, Observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy, as the Lord your God has commanded you. For six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath for the Lord your God. You shall do no work on that day, neither you nor your son nor your daughter, nor your servants, men or women, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your animals, nor the stranger who lives with you. Thus, your servant, man or woman, shall rest as you do. Remember that you were once a servant or a slave in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord your God brought you out from there with mighty hand and outstretched arm. Because of this, the Lord your God has commanded you to keep the Sabbath. So Exodus's motive huh, is that God is the creator, and so it's a day set aside in a particular way to thank him for the gift of creation and to enter into his rest. The motive that the Lord reveals in Deuteronomy has to do with the fact that God's not just a creator, he's a liberator. And so today is a day set aside to remember once I was not free, and once I had no life, once I was a slave, and God has rescued me by the work that he did in Egypt. So again, Pope Benedict puts it this way, the Sabbath is a day of God's freedom and the day of participation in God's freedom. The Sabbath is not simply remembrance of what is past, but an active exercise of freedom. So here again, the commandment isn't to do nothing, it's a command to rest and to enjoy liberation from the servitude of work. Does that make sense? Those are the two... Um, motives. So commandment, two places, two different motives, one having to do with gratitude for uh, the creator, one having to do with gratitude for uh, the God who frees. Unfortunately, at the time of Jesus, um, the Sabbath and the observance of the Sabbath was something like a um, like a religious litmus test. So if you really want to find out who the devout Jews were, the time of Jesus, according to those who were um, uh, amongst many of the religious leaders, it, the, the serious Jews were noted by how they observed this day, what they did and did not do. And so in the gospel accounts, I'll, I'll, we'll look at a, a few in just a second, you'll see oftentimes something either says at the very beginning, now it was a Sabbath day, and then Jesus begins to do something. Or he does something and it ends with, and all this took place on a Sabbath. That's kind of the gospel writer's way of saying, this is provoking a conflict. Because at the time of Jesus, amongst many people who were involved in leadership, the Sabbath had been turned from a day of uh, rest and worship to a day of rules and regulations and do's and don'ts. And so it was anything but a day of freedom and joy it had become instead um, more like a day of bondage, okay? So flip to, um, flip to chapter uh, 6 in Luke's gospel. So Luke 6, Matthew, Mark, Luke, New Testament, for those of us who are still finding our way through the Bible. There is more than, there's more than a dozen passages we could look at. I just want to look at three. All in Luke. So there's actually back-to-back stories of things that take place on the Sabbath, which provoke um, the anger of um, the religious leaders to Jesus. But I want to look at the second one in Luke 6. So Luke 6, verse 6. Everybody there? Got a page, Tim? 109. All right. On another Sabbath, when Jesus entered the synagogue and taught, a man was there whose right hand was withered. So get a load of this. Just for those of us who can close our eyes and picture things, picture this, get into this scene, right? And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him, Jesus, to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might find an accusation against him. They actually had prescriptions on what was allowed to be healed on a Sabbath. This, this, and this, that's okay. This thing, come back on another day. We laugh. It's not, it wasn't funny. And then you break the Sabbath and you are ostracized and out of the community. So here's a man who's sick 
He's in need. Huh? He's got a withered hand. He's in pain. And rather than what is it we can do to help you, they all look at Jesus to see, okay, is this clown going to do something to help this guy? Man, I hope he does because then we can pound on him. That's the environment. So they were watching him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might find an accusation against him. Why? Because they're trying to find something they can do to get rid of him and to silence him because he is disrupting the people. But Jesus knew their thoughts, and he said to the man who had the withered hand, come and stand here. So just in case you all haven't noticed that the guy's got an illness, I want him to stand here in front of everybody. And then Jesus rose, or the man rose and stood there, and Jesus said to them, those who were watching him, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm? To save life or destroy it? In one of the other accounts of this same passage, Jesus' words uh, are more like, um, if one of you has uh, an ox and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, do you leave it there and get it the next day? Or do you rescue it? Well, they all rescue it. Here he uses these words, huh? Is it lawful to do good or to do harm, to save life and to destroy it? And they don't answer, as is often the case. And he looked around at them all and said to them, Stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored. But they were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. All we're trying to do here is to see that this gift that God had given of the Sabbath had been turned by um, a misunderstanding of the Scriptures into something which was no longer a gift. Flip to uh, Luke chapter 13, starting in verse 10. Now Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. And when Jesus saw her, he called her and said to her, Woman, you are freed of your infirmity. And he laid his hands upon her, and immediately she was made straight, and she praised God. Now get a load of this response. But the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, There are six days on work on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed. Not on the Sabbath day. Why? Because they had equated these kind, certain particular kinds of healings of illnesses and whatnot. Work and work is forbidden, in their understanding, on the Sabbath. And then the Lord answered him, You hypocrites! Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? In other words, isn't this precisely the point of the Sabbath? That healing should take place, that freedom should come. That motivation for worship of the God who does this should be offered. And he said this, and as he said this, all his adversaries were put to shame and the people rejoiced at all the glorious things that were done by him. And then lastly, uh, next, next chapter, Luke 14. One Sabbath... When Jesus went to dine at the house of a ruler who belonged to the Pharisees, they were watching him. And behold, there was a man before, whom, who, before him who had dropsy. And Jesus spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they were silent. 
And then he took him, healed him, and let him go. And he said to them, which of you having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath? And they could not reply to this. So this is why Jesus says in another passage in the Gospels um, that the Sabbath is made for man and not man for the Sabbath. And even more provocatively, it's why Jesus says that's why the Son of Man, meaning himself, is Lord even of the Sabbath, which is unthinkable for a, a mere man to say something like that. The Sabbath is a commandment. Here's Jesus saying, I'm Lord of this commandment which is a divine claim. Okay? So the fact that the Sabbath is made for man and not man for the Sabbath doesn't mean that you and I are supposed to be able to do whatever it is we want with it. It's to say that the, God gave us this as a gift and not as a burden. This is um, appropriate, I think, for us as Christians, because I know a lot of Christians who struggle with what it is that they can't, quote-unquote, can and cannot do on Sunday. And maybe we can talk a little bit about that at the end. So again, Sunday is not a day to do nothing. It's a day to be free from compulsion. It's a day to rest. It's a day to enjoy. It's a day to play. It's a day to pray. It's a day to remember what God has done for us. It's a day to help each, each other. And it's a day to worship. That's what Sunday's for. Some of us are old enough to remember when things were closed on Sundays. So those of us who are younger can't fathom that. Some of us still go to places where um, stores are closed on Sundays. It's usually really devout Protestant areas. Some stores which are owned by Christian owners are closed on Sundays. There aren't many of them, but there are a few. It's intentional, right? So our culture um, doesn't know that, unfortunately. Okay. So the Old Testament motive, the two motives... Praise of God for creation, entering into his rest, and then thanksgiving for his liberation out of slavery. Those two things are fulfilled in Jesus and in his death and his resurrection, which is the reason why the Sabbath and the observance of it for Christians moves from Saturday to Sunday. Okay? That confuses people often. All right? So God's creation was restored by Jesus by his resurrection. And his resurrection happened on a what day? Happened on a Sunday, not a Tuesday. Days matter. Days matter because God acts in time. God acts in history. The creed is not once upon a time, long, long ago, or in a galaxy far, far away. The creed is suffered under Pontius Pilate. Right? It's rooted in history. The Gospels are rooted in history. God acts in history. Sunday is a day unlike every other day of the week. And, oh, by the way, so is Friday. It's interesting to me that perhaps more than any other day of the week, sin takes place on Friday. Everybody's working for the weekend. Friday is the day he suffered his passion. I don't think that's coincidence. So Sunday matters. I remember I was at a church once, uh, and um, they used to have a, a mass. They were really careful how they worded this. But the, imp the impression that a number of people had was that it was a mass that did not play take place on Sunday. Um, but a number of the people in the parish had the impression that the mass counted for Sunday. So it was a mass on a Monday night. And so they would actually do the Sunday readings on Monday uh, and whatnot. And so I got there, and um, we didn't do that anymore. So, <laughs> shocking. So, kept the Mass, but, you know, daily readings and blah, blah, blah. And I remember talking to a woman after Mass uh, one time, and she was irate that I had the gall to say that the Mass on Monday did not fulfill your Sunday obligation, and it, and it did not count. And she looked at me as we were talking. She says, do you really think God cares what day you go to Mass? And I said, I, matter of fact, I do. It's a commandment. And Jesus rose on a Sunday. She said, I can't go on Sunday. It's my day for my horse. And I went, wait a minute. 
your, your horse knows the days of the week? Like, see your horse on Monday or Saturday. Well, I can't do that. Well, take that up with God, right? So dates matter. Time matters. Um, dates are really significant for us in the church. Yeah. Ah, great question. So what about the Saturday vigil? So the Saturday vigil, so days start, it's kind of a Jewish way of thinking, and it's an ancient way of thinking too. So the day starts with sundown. So Sunday starts with sundown. Monday starts with sundown too, right, on Sunday night. So the vigil on Saturday, which may or may not be sundown, um, is uh, included into Sunday worship. But here's a question. So if, if you go to Mass on Saturday so that you don't have to go on Sunday, uh, thou hast not fulfilled the obligation. You're not in, you, now you're really... Now I'm, I'm, I'm treating Sunday like it's my day again. So the Vigil Mass was instituted in a, in a primary way for um, people who couldn't get to work or get to Mass on Sunday because of work. So doctors, nurses people who do public service, who have to work on Sunday to provide for other people. So there's, there's reasons for that, right? Um, that, that's the idea behind uh, Saturday Mass. There's a lot of, and there might be some people in here too, there's a lot of um, people who have more years than I do. Um, so they're older than I am. <laughs> Forget the delicate. Okay, so older people than me um, often go to Mass on Saturday because they want to be able to go to the first celebration of the Mass. That's how they understood it. So if there was a Mass at 4 on a Saturday, and it was the first Mass for Sunday, I'm there. And that was their motive. So it was a good, it's a good motive, right? Nothing wrong with that. But um, that's how it is that Saturday is part of Sunday. It's the vigil, all right? And we call it the vigil Mass. So in the church, we celebrate vigils of feasts. So... Uh, the vigil of the Immaculate Conception, or the vigil of the Assumption, or the vigil of Pentecost. Um, your birthday might be a vigil for that. <laughs> might be, maybe not. Um, but don't do it so that you get out of having, so that you can just sleep in all day on Sunday, or just veg in front of the TV and watch football on Sunday. That would not be really entering into the spirit of Sunday. Ooh, so the Easter Vigil is um, the mother, this is what we actually call it, the mother of all vigils, <laughs> all right? So the Easter Vigil is the greatest uh, and longest night in the church. It is the, so if you want to see the church in her entirety as she really is, in its fullness, you'll see it at the Vigil, because you will see... Um, those who are coming into the church getting baptized, those who are coming into the church in full communion making confirmation, those who are coming into the church, uh, or those who are already in the church who've received the sacraments of initiation, you'll see um, the whole congregation gathered around the bishop or the bishop's representative and the priest. Um, you'll hear a um, long selection of scriptures which take us through salvation history from Genesis up until uh, the New Testament. Um, and it brings to a, um, a glorious close um, the somberness of Lent. So it is the day. So it, from the very beginning, um, this night and this celebration was the night in which those who were coming in to the church came into the church because the next day, Easter, is the day or that night is the night in which the Lord triumphs over sin and death and baptism is a sharing in his death and his resurrection, as you learned this weekend. Right? Does that make sense? And it's also, so Sunday is in the church, um, Sunday is the eighth day of the week, quote unquote. That's how it's actually worded in especially a lot of the writings of the early church. Sunday is the eighth day of the week. It's the eighth day from the first day of creation. And so, in, which is also why Sunday is the first day of the week and not the end of the weekend. So, in the ancient church, um, a baptistry, uh, 
there was a baptistry and not a baptismal font. So a baptistry, if you go to Europe, go to Florence, and you can see a baptistry which is as big as our church, more or less. It's massive. It's tall. It's big. It's decorated like crazy with mosaics. And it's eight-sided. That's because Easter is the eighth day, or Sunday is the eighth day of the week, and the Lord rises on this day. And so as lots of different ways to teach people, a baptismal or a baptistry is shaped like an octagon. Um, some baptistry or some baptismal fonts in churches are also shaped like octagons, but that's just a little aside. So just as everything, God created everything, so also he recreated it through the resurrection of his son, thus it's the fulfillment of the first motive of Exodus. Does that, is that kind of clear? Yeah? So if you count eight days from the first day, that's, you'll, you'll end up on um, Easter. So, that, so it's, it's, not, um, it's not by chronologically actually counting. It's outside of time is how it would be understood. So you get Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. That's seven days. Sunday, the eighth day. All of time is, yeah, first day of creation, Monday. Or excuse me, Sunday. Yeah, sorry, it's late. Yeah. So creation starts on Sunday, right? So Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, all of a sudden recreation takes place in the resurrection. Okay, so the eighth day. So that's the first motive. Second motive is also fulfilled on Easter, right? So the second motive is liberation. So Deuteronomy commemorates the liberation from the tyranny of Pharaoh and the slavery of Egypt, which is but an image or a type. Remember we talked about typology? So types are people, places, events, things in the Old Testament, which help us better understand people, places, events, things in the New Testament. Pharaoh is a type of Satan. He's an image of Satan who wants to restrict our freedom and to ruin our lives and ultimately to kill us. So the Sabbath is motivated in, in Deuteronomy by God's deliverance of his people from the slavery in Egypt. That's fulfilled in Jesus, who is the definitive liberator who liberates us from death and hell and from the power of the enemy. So the Catechism 2175 says it this way. In Christ's Passover, Sunday fulfills the spiritual truth of the Jewish Sabbath, and announced man's eternal rest in God. So it's because of what Jesus has done for us on a Sunday that this day is absolutely unique. That's why it's not the last day of the weekend. And the very first Christians understood it that way. So the, the Christians immediately begin celebrating the Lord's Day on Sunday. You'll see this in a couple of places in the... Uh, uh, in Scripture, Revelation 1, uh, verse 10, talks a little bit about it. So John talks about being caught up on the Lord's Day into a vision of heaven. And the Lord's Day is Sunday. Um, St. Justin Martyr, who gives us the longest account of the Mass from antiquity that we have, Justin dies in 155. Um, the account's found in the Catechism. I forget what paragraph it is, but it's, it's in there in the section of the Eucharist. So he actually describes in a letter to the emperor, this is what we do when we all gather together. We gather on the Lord's Day and we do these things. And it's Sunday. So from the very beginning, the Christians um, moved the day, if you will. Okay, does that make sense? Good? All right, let me just make a couple of particulars and then if we've got some questions, we can take them and then we can wrap up. Um, so first, we talked a little bit about this um, when we were talking about confession on the retreat, but just to say it again. So, um, sin is distinguished between being deadly and being venial. So, deadly sin, so this is, both of these come right out of First John 5. All sin is wrongdoing, not all sin is deadly. So, in order to be deadly, you need to meet three conditions. Anybody remember what they are? So freedom of consent, so willingness, right? Grave matter. That's the consent, right? So freedom, right? Freedom, knowing, and grave matter, right? So y'all know 
uh, now that missing Mass on Sunday is grave. If you didn't, you do now. Okay, so it's grave to miss Mass. That's one of the three conditions for deadly sin. You've now got one. Good for you. Okay. Um, grave just means weighty, substantial. Okay. So um, to miss Mass on Sunday is always, all caps underlined in bold, always grave. Always. Always. So I tell every child when they come to confession in the school or in the after-school program, when I ask them, do you go to Mass every Sunday? Yeah, well, not every Sunday. Well, how often do you go? Oh, uh, like a couple times a month. Okay. Why don't you go when you can't go? I mean, you can't drive, obviously, but why don't you go? Uh, we're busy. You too busy for God? Oh, I know where you're going with that. So then I just say, you know, you should go home and tell your mom and dad, you know, did you know that when you baptized me, dad, that you promised to take me to church every Sunday? And then the parents call me <laughs> and say, what are you doing telling my kid this? Well, you did. You promised that you would take your child to Mass every Sunday. I asked you a question when you presented your child for baptism. I asked you, do you clearly understand what you are undertaking? After I asked you, it will be, or told you, it will be your duty to bring him or her up to keep God's commandments as Christ taught us by loving God and loving our neighbor. Do you clearly understand what you're undertaking? Yes or no, right? Yes means, okay, I'm going to take my child to church every Sunday and a whole set of other things. Somehow that, like, boatloads of parents didn't get the memo, like, which is probably our fault. We just did a bad job teaching it, so we need to teach it better. And we need to teach why. So I'll, I'll own that. That's fine. I'm trying to make up for it right now. Hang on just one sec. So to miss Mass on Sunday is grave. Always. Now, what if you got pneumonia? If you, go to mass on, if you don't go to Mass on Sunday because you got pneumonia, was it deadly sin? No? No, it's not deadly. You're not free. You're not free if you've got pneumonia. If you contract leprosy, okay, or bubonic plague, don't come to Mass. <laughs> Stay home. We don't want bubonic plague, all right, or Spanish flu or anything like that. Stay home. But it's still grave. All right, it's still one of the three things. Why? Be why is it that God obliges us to come to Mass? Because he, he obliges me to feed on divine flesh that can't die. It's like your mom saying, you must eat. Like, why? You will die if you don't eat, right? You must drink. You must sleep. So it's always grave. It's not always deadly. Okay? Yeah. Is it, is it sin not to take your child to church? Ah, good question. Is it sin not to take your child to church? What did you promise? So the most, most significant thing that... so. Susie X over here, not you. So, and, it, and this gets complex, right? Because you've got lots of, you, you can't undo where you are right now. The question is, what do I do now, Lord? What's the right thing to do, right? If you have a child, we did this when we were on retreat. If you're married, you're in an arranged marriage. Because Jesus says, what God has joined together, no man must separate. If you're married, validly, Sacramentally, it's an arranged marriage, which begs the question, which should be asked, Lord, why did you bring us together? What's the purpose? And we argued over the weekend, or I argued over the weekend, that the purpose is primarily, primarily, more than anything else, to make Jesus' love tangible to your spouse. That is the purpose, because a sacrament is a sign of an invisible reality. The sign is your love, your compassion, your kindness, your generosity, your mercy. For your husband or wife, the invisible reality is Jesus' love. So a spouse should be able to say to the other spouse, because of you, I know who God is. Better. Because of you. God has used you to help me understand and experience him better. That's what marriage is about. Okay? 
if you have a child, and, and I realize, so I'm, I'm asking you to do this, to put on lenses, which um, can be jarring at times. I get that. Then we have to go wrestle that with God. But the lens that I, I want to try to get parents to really put on, if you have a child, to ask God, why do I have this child? What is the reason you have given her or him to me? What is the reason for which they've been created? And I would argue again, there's only one reason ultimately. They were created to enter into a relationship with God, which happens through Jesus in a unique way. And the most astounding thing that a mom or a dad can do is to introduce a child to the Lord. Nothing else matters and nothing else compares. And no one's role is more significant. I can't make my child become a disciple. They have to choose that on their own, just like my mom and dad couldn't make me a disciple, and they certainly learned that. I had to own that one day. But their task, and they understood it, was to live in such a way and to teach in such a way and to model the faith in such a way that I knew that was the way that I was supposed to live. I just had to choose it. Somewhere in there is an answer. Right? We want to we always be careful, right, whenever we do these things. So what we just said, and we said this on retreat too, so the moment you start saying this stuff about marriage, a whole set of, a whole set of us, all of us, right, feel in some sense uh, inadequate. Like, I don't think I'm doing that. Just like when I start talking about priesthood or reading about priesthood and the mission and the task of priesthood, I go, I ain't doing that. So we all fall short. So we want to be careful that we don't let the enemy get in there and accuse and condemn. Because God never does that. God convicts. God says, son, you're not, you're not doing this right. You could do this better. You know that. And he convicts us that way. But he never condemns me. And grace is such that God offers power to us, no matter where we are in our lives right now, to be able to go, hey, you know what? Maybe I've lived that way for however long. Starting now, I want to live a new way. And that's the purpose for the conviction, is so that we can begin to embrace God's will and we can begin to live freedom evermore. Does that make sense? So be careful. Be, be very careful. Um, not to feel condemned. There's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. There is conviction, plenty of it. I'm convicted routinely. But whenever I'm condemned in any way, I know it's coming from hell, so don't, don't give in to that. Okay, so Sunday is always great. Now, flip to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10. Uh-oh, book we haven't gone to very often. Where in the world is Hebrews? Sounds like it's in the Old Testament, but it's not. It's in the New. All right? Anybody there? Got a page in your Bible? Hebrews 10. Excuse me? 340? Great. So I always find this to be um, both, I don't know, comical and comforting. That this is not a new challenge to get people to come to Mass. It's in the New Testament. So the author to the letter to the Hebrews, which is not a letter and it's not to the Hebrews, um, but that's for another day. Uh, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Don't you wonder how sometimes you get names? But anyway, let's hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. That, that's, that's in reference to the Lord's Day. So, 1025, sorry. Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So, low mass attendance uh, goes back to the beginning. If you flip to um, Catechism 2178, this is a, another um, comforting, sobering, comical passage. So this is from an early letter on the Lord's Day. So in the early centuries of the church, the author says this. 
Tradition preserves the memory of an ever-timely exhortation. Come to church early. Because they can picture the stragglers coming in the middle of the... Apparently even in the first century, right? People are timing things in the parking lot. (laughs) Approach the Lord. Confess your sins. Repent in prayer. Be present at the sacred and divine liturgy. Conclude its prayer. And do not leave before the dismissal. Another common prayer. Like, I shouldn't be waiting in line to get out of church at the end of Mass. You know, like, I should be the one leading everybody out. I shouldn't have to stand there as people are kind of funneling out in front of me. Um, Let the Lord leave in the person of his minister, and then we leave, right? But we don't do that. So, again, these are not new problems. Um, This is human, fallen human nature. We're always sitting there going, okay, I think that made the obligation. We can go now which just means we really have not understood what this is all about. Okay? So first thing, grave matter. Second, um, there's a fast involved in coming to Mass. So some of us know this, some of us don't. It's just important to know. So um, we are, um, unless you're over a a certain age or you're sick, okay, Um, you are to fast from food, and drink other than water an hour before communion. So the good thing about us here when we were preaching a half hour is it's like it didn't matter, right? I mean, like you could have eaten on the way out of the car into the church and you still would have made it. But So you're, you're not supposed to um, eat food for an hour before communion. And since you don't know if it's going to be a short homily or a long homily, I would start it from, so if you're going to 10 o'clock mass, don't eat after 9 why? This is, this, this is the law, and it's changed. It used to be that you couldn't eat the night before until you went to communion. Some of us remember that. I remember that. For some, you couldn't drink. Who, who, who wants to be the person giving the talk after lunch? You ever been that guy or that woman? A lot of fun, right? It's like me to you right now. You just ate. It's the end of the day. There's a lot of this. I'll get your notes later. Right? So um, creating, um, creating physical hunger, and for crying out loud, it's an hour. Right? But creating physical hunger uh, also in- intensifies the ability to hear. It's why in the season of Lent, which is coming up, and we'll talk about that when it gets here in a couple of weeks, um, The church really strongly encourages that we do uh, penitential acts. Foremost among them would be prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. Anybody in here, um, anybody in here ever fasted more than a day, not because you had surgery coming up? Anybody here ever fasted a week? Anybody here ever fasted longer than a week? How long have you fasted? Nine days. So I lived with the guy. So I fasted for I don't know, a couple of weeks, maybe. Um, and I'll tell you this: you, your antenna, if you will, spiritually, are really high. You hear God like you ain't never heard God. It just creates an appetite and a hunger for Him in a way that when we're full and sated, it's hard. It's hard to concentrate. So I lived with a guy, he's a priest in Minneapolis. He used to fast for the entirety of Lent. So Lent's 40 days, and and the Sundays too. So he did not eat a thing for all of Lent. He drank, drank tons of water. You can only drink water. Once you get past like day three, you better only drink water. You're going to get sick. Um, And he was um, dripping with joy unbelievably kind, loving. If you do fast and you stop being joyful, kind, and loving, start eating again. (laughs) Seriously, because the fast is useless. Fasting is supposed to help us grow in conformity to Jesus, not see how tough we can be. And if you're not being kind and gentle and loving, then you're not like Jesus. Just have the cake, okay? Um, But I offer that to you just to say, if you've never done this, I cannot encourage it enough, not for all of Lent, um, but set aside a day every week during Lent. Maybe it's Friday. It's a great day to fast because it's the day of the Lord's Passion. And what you do is you just drink liquids until dinner. 
or you can go all day long. And you do it for a purpose. So you say, Lord, I abstain from food this day. Why? Out of love for Eloise. And what's going on? I'm going to abstain from food for Isabel. That the Lord will, whatever. So always connect it to some purpose, some intention, some person that you love. Um, Fasting is like spiritual artillery, I think. Heavy artillery. Jesus says in the Gospels, not if you fast, but when you fast. There's an expectation that his, his disciples will fast. You cannot fast, or you should not fast, during Easter, because Easter is a season of joy and celebration. In fact, it used to be forbidden in the early church to fast during Easter, because um, it just didn't keep with the season. But Lent is very much about just finding ways that we can be more attuned to God. So some of us came out of the retreat with a resolution like, I'm going to try to get to adoration once a week because we experienced the Lord there in a unique way. And it was new for a number of us. It's like, I want to hold on to that. So a lot of us left there with that resolution in mind. I might encourage you to think about, all right, start thinking now, what am I going to do for Lent? Starts February 14th, Valentine's Day. What am I going to do? How is it that I can enter into this so as to hear God better? Yeah. Do you think, I mean, I'm coming into this um, at an age where I can understand and be discerning, but it's so helpful that those who just grow up so much more, like you know, you must do it because it's not a plain thing that you have to go out. I'm taking my very first experience in the church was up in, on the beach in North Carolina, and they had a big Sabbath day. Right. So I find taboos to be remarkably attractive. You tell me I can't do something and you do not tell me why, I'm going to do it. Um, that's just my fallen nature. That's not true anymore, but it was very much the case when I was young, you know? Yeah, well, I would have done that too. I probably would have hit her, but um, <laughs> you are much kinder than me. Um, so, yeah, it is important to know the reasons why. That's the point, right? So fast, there's, there's reasons behind this, right? Jesus fasts. You know, it's like the understatement of the century in the scriptures. You know, Jesus went out in the desert. He fasted for 40 days, and at the end of it, he was hungry. You think? <laughs> well, but try, try, try doing something to to create space, okay? So that's the fast. Um, flip to, yeah. You said we shouldn't have food before, uh, an hour before communion, can we have coffee in the morning? Uh, I can, if I've had a previous mass. <laughs> um, so uh, I would limit yourself to water. Yeah. So I'd just stick with water before. Get up earlier and have the coffee earlier so you don't have to worry about the hour in between, right? Um, flip to 2185. So let's just look at what is to be avoided and what is to be done. So 2185 in the Catechism. Here's how the church words it. On Sundays and other holy days of obligation, the faithful are to refrain from engaging in work or activities that hinder the worship owed to God. The joy proper to the Lord's day, the performance of the works of mercy, that's a do, and the appropriate relaxation of mind and body. In other words, enjoy the day. Family needs or important social rest can legitimately excuse from the obligation of Sunday rest. So you can't look at your, you know, can't look at your husband or your wife and say, honey, I can't do the laundry because it's Sunday. If you have to do the laundry because there's nothing left to wear or the kids, you know. The faithful should see to it that legitimate excuses do not lead to habits prejudicial to religion, family life, and health. So 
th- th- here's part of the challenge. This is different for different ones of us. Some of us find working in a garden compulsion. Some of us love to work in a garden, and we find it leisurely. If you're the former, don't do it. If you're the latter, have at it. And then don't look at your neighbor and go, how come you're working in the garden? Well, clearly, brother, this is an issue for you, but it's not for me. So, so different ones of us find certain things compulsions and certain ones find them leisurely, okay? So we just need to be honest with ourselves and go, what is it, what's in my Sunday right now that doesn't need to be there so that I can more fully enjoy this day and let it be a day unlike every other day? Right? Yeah, so flip to 2187. Twenty one eighty six lists a number of things that are good to do on Sundays, so it's a good day to do Good works, humble service to the poor, to the sick, the infirm, the elderly. It's a great day to go visit people who are sick. Devoting care and time to families and relatives, which is often difficult to do on other days of the week. Like for some people, the most important thing to do would be, I don't think we're eating together on Sunday. We should have a family meal. Um, Time for reflection, silence, cultivation of the mind, and meditation. And then 2187 addresses people in social services and whatnot, public services. So sanctifying Sundays and holy days requires a common effort. Every Christian should, make, should avoid making unnecessary demands on others that would hinder them from observing the Lord's Day. Traditional activities, sport, restaurants, etc., social activities, public services, etc., require some people to work on Sundays. But everyone should still take care to set aside sufficient time for leisure With temperance and charity, the faithful will see to it that they avoid the excesses and violence sometimes associated with popular leisure activities. In spite of economic restraints, public authorities should ensure citizens a time intended for rest and divine worship, and employers have a similar obligation toward their employees. So, for example, if if I'm managing a hospital, I need doctors and nurses on Sundays, right? But I should be looking at that with an understanding of, well, I'm not going to schedule you every, sun- every Sunday. We've got to share this, okay? Policemen, fire people, you know, fire services. All those public services which we need, and you can't, uh, you know, you can't just say, sorry, when I'm working today. Um, we need to find, there, there needs to be um, a way to do this where it's not becoming constantly burdensome to the person. And then there's things that you can do when that's you, you know. Like so, if you're a doctor or a nurse, um, you know, you try to. Uh, if you're scheduled both Saturday and Sunday, and you've missed every mass, um, see if someone can bring you communion. So uh, we'll talk about that at another time. But how we do that sometimes. So we bring, we call people forward at the end of mass. You know, you see us call people forward every mass those who are taking sick to the homebound, right? So they have a, something that they, a container, it's called a PIX. Uh, and we put a, the Blessed Sacrament in there, and they, then they go immediately to the sick. Or sometimes it's to somebody who, um, they're a physician, right? And they can't get there, can't get to Mass. They're not blowing off church. They're doing open-heart surgery. So you can't just walk out. Sorry, i got to go to Mass. Um, that, that would not be kind. Um, yeah, and then lastly, I might just say, you know, Sunday's, Sunday's supposed to be just a day that you and I can, um, here, here's, what it, here's what it is for so many people. Sunday is a day of, oh, shoot, the weekend is over, and I got to go back to work tomorrow. And then you start, like, getting ready for all the things you got to do tomorrow, and then Sunday's gone. That's just become a habit for lots of us, right? Uh, I want to knock this out now so I have to get to the office tomorrow and see it all staring at me. And what happens is 
good motive. I'm not doubting that at all. I mean, I can fall into this too all the time. But it means I've, I've lost the gift that God gave me. God's trying to get me to relax, to play, to thank him, to worship him, to rest. Okay? I'm doing homework on a Sunday. Great question. Yeah, so again, you want to be careful. You don't get scrupulous with this, right? But so if... <laughs> I would encourage you to try... I would encourage anybody in a situation like that, try to do everything you can to, to use Saturday so that you can give the Lord Sunday. Here, here's, actually, I would... I would challenge somebody, I'd dare them. Um, see if God will outdo you in generosity. Like, Lord, I'll give you, I'll give you my Sunday. You can have it. I'm going to work hard on Saturday for this time, not the whole day, right? Because so you, you need to rest. But then I'm going to trust, Lord, that the reason why you gave this was, was in fact a gift to me. So you'll see oftentimes in scripture, you'll see people do things like, okay, I'm going to test you, Lord, on this. I'm going to do it for a month. Just not going to do any homework for a month on Sundays. I'm going to see what it's like. If you fail every class, then you're probably not doing it right. Because <laughs> that means you're not using Saturday either, right? So don't do that. But um, there's something about, um, God even says on a number of occasions in the scriptures, try me on this, test me. And see if I don't pay you back in ways you could never have guessed. So maybe you do that. Who knows? Okay. Yeah. No, so if you're sick, it's not deadly. So you don't have to mention that in confession because you're, you're only obliged to confess deadly sin. So it's not deadly, even though it was grave, right? So you missed, it's grave, it wasn't deadly. Um, so I still didn't fulfill the Sunday obligation, so it's still, it's, it's venial, right? It's just not deadly. I mean, it's something, yeah, I mean, it, you, you shouldn't, don't feel guilty, but it's, um, so it's not a matter of guilt, but it is a matter of I've missed something which, um, most especially the Eucharist, right, which God intended me to have and which he says I need, otherwise I don't have any life within me. So it's not a question of guilt, right? So it's a helpful question, yeah. Like you don't go to confession and say, forgive me, Father, I had the flu last week. Like, that's not your fault, right? And therefore I wasn't able to do this, 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 this. Yeah, good question. Yeah, so holy days of obligation, and there are only few now, are to be treated the same way as Sundays. So it is an obligation. You are obliged to feed on divine flesh, partake in the divine nature. Oh, darn, right? Um, and it's an obligation for us to provide masses so that you can attend, hopefully. To rest? No, it would not be great. Yeah, sorry, I can't work today, boss. It's a uh, feast of the Immaculate Conception. <laughs> that ain't gonna fly. Um, so, no, the it, the obligation has to do with um, getting to mass. Okay, yeah. Correct. To miss mass um, for not a good reason would be deadly. If you knew it, and now you know it. And then you should not go to communion. To do so would actually be another deadly sin if you knew it, and now you know it. So that would be a double header. Stay away from that one. So miss mass intentionally or for no valid reason, right? Um, my child's five-year-old foosball tournament doesn't count. So, um, yeah, then you just go to mass the next week and you go to communion. That's, also, that's actually eating and drinking condemnation. Don't, don't do that. That's what scripture says. I'm not sure what that is, but I don't want to eat and drink condemnation. Yeah. 
Yeah, great question. So, like, what do you do when when you got a household and three kids have the flu? Yeah. So someone's got to stay home, right? You can't just go, kids, good luck, we're going to Mass. It probably wouldn't work. Um, wouldn't be a good thing to do either. So, um, yeah, l- so let me end with this, okay? And then see if it'll help. And I, I'll end with this because I find this really provocative because I don't think this is how most Christians live. It was the year 304 during the Diocletian persecution in North Africa when Roman officials surprised a group of about 50 Christians who were attending the Sunday Eucharist to take them into custody. The transcript of the interrogations has been preserved. The proconsul said to the presbyter, quote, by gathering all these together here, you have acted against the orders of the emperors and the Caesars, unquote. The Christian author adds at this point that the presbyter's response was inspired by the Holy Spirit. He said, quote, unconcerned about that, we have been celebrating what is the Lord's. What the Lord's is, or what is the Lord's, that's how I would translate the Latin word that he uses. This is Pope Benedict. Its complex meaning can hardly be translated at all. First of all, it denotes the Lord's day, but at the same time, it refers to the content of this day to the sacrament of the Lord, to his resurrection and his presence in the Eucharistic event. Let us return to the transcript. The proconsul insists on knowing why. The composed, superb response of the priest follows, quote, We have done this because that which is the Lord's cannot cease. Here the realization is unambiguously expressed that the Lord stands above the Lord's, the Caesars and the Emperor's, The owner of the house where the Sunday celebration of the Eucharist had taken place answered perhaps even more impressively in response to the question of why he had permitted the forbidden gathering in his house. He said, first of all, that those gathered were his brothers and his sisters, and he could not show them to the door. Once again, the proconsul was insistent. And there in the second response, the real ground, the motive, came to light. You had to forbid them entry, the proconsul said. I couldn't answered the owner of the house. Here's the point. This is what he says. For without the day of the Lord, we cannot exist. The clear and decisive we cannot of the Christian conscience stands opposite the will of the Caesars. Without the day of the Lord, we cannot exist. This is not arduous obedience toward a law of the church felt to be external to oneself. It is an expression of both interior necessity and desire. It points to that which has become the sustaining center of one's own existence, one's entire being. It indicates something that has become so important that it must be done out of a feeling of great inner security and freedom, even at the risk of one's own life. For these Christians, it was not a case of choosing between one law and another, but of choosing between the meaning that sustains life and a meaningless life. That's a Christian's understanding of Sunday. If it helps, I'm convicted by that. Because my Sunday isn't always everything that it could be and should be. But the key is, don't think legally. Think the, the, the deeper question is, do I live in such a way, for all of us, right? Do I live in such a way that I really think that I can't exist without this day? Because this is the day that the Lord triumphed over death and over sin and over hell. It's the day that he gives me himself. It's the day where I taste his freedom. And I don't think most people on a Sunday at any given Catholic church think that way. But that's beside the point. The question is, do I think that way? And what do I need to do to begin to think that way? Which might be as simple as, Lord, help me to think that way. Help me to live in such a way that I can't live without this.
when you get that right, then you get the answers to these other questions, right? That's the starting point, I think, for me anyway. It's a quote from a book. <laughs> um, yeah. I'll copy it for you. You ain't going to find that in the catechism. If you want, I'll copy it for you. It's an amazing, um, maybe I'll copy and bring it next week. The, the book is called A New Song for the Lord. From my library. That's right. It says, this belongs to the library of Father John Ricardo. Give it back. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody.